Hey everybody, thanks for joining me. Congratulations on making it to Unit 3. Today starts our beginning uh, into Unit 3. Unit 3 is all about populations. And in this unit, we're going to answer questions like how do changes in the habitat cause changes in species over time? How is educational opportunity for women connected to changes in the human population? And how does the growing human population impact the environment? And how does the environment impact the human population? But before we can start diving into these questions, you need to understand a couple basic facts about populations in nature. The first is that there are four main variables that influence the population size. This is pretty straightforward. We hinted at it when we learned about island biogeography theory. Uh, things that will increase a population are births and immigration to a population, and things that will decrease a population are deaths and emigration. And it's important for you to remember that a population could be as small as a group of birds on a tree, it could be as mid-sized as a neighborhood or a suburb, it could be as large as a city, a country, or even the entire earth if we want to start talking about aliens. So births and immigration will increase the population, deaths and emigration will decrease that population. Additionally, there are a, a numerous number of factors throughout the natural world that can impact a population. And ecologists tend to group them into one of two categories based on uh, the density of the population. And uh, we tend to think about them as factors that are dependent on the density of the population and factors that are not dependent on the density. Density dependent factors are ones that will change the population based on how big and how dense that population is. Examples include access to food or air, uh, access to uh, territory, the amount of competition in an area, how much disease there is. As the population grows more dense, these density dependent factors are going to become more intense. Right, a one square kilometer is plenty of place, uh, plenty of space for one individual. Let's say one bobcat, maybe. Uh, but if you increase that to ten bobcats, hundred bobcats, suddenly the density of that population is going to make this factor much, much more uh, intense in terms of limiting the size of the population. Same with food. Uh, a low population is going to require less food than a large population. And so food availability is a density dependent factor. It depends on how large and how dense that um, uh, the population is. On the flip side, density independent factors are factors that change the population size but regardless of how big the population is and how dense it is in originally. And those are things like natural disasters, um, global warming, climate change, sea level rise, etc. Uh, these, uh, like a forest fire will come through and wipe out a forest. It doesn't really matter how dense the population of trees and animals is in that forest. Uh, a fire is going to not, not discriminate in that sense. Two other examples include uh, predation, which is density dependent. Uh, the more organisms there are in a community, the more predation there is going to be. Uh, whereas drought is density independent. It doesn't matter how many deer there are in an environment. Drought is still going to have a negative impact on the, uh, on, uh, on the population regardless of how many deer there are. Okay, so now that we've covered that, I want to talk a little bit about something called the life history strategies. Life history strategies help us answer the questions of how populations persist, how they change, how they grow over their own lifespan. And I include this picture of a tadpole on the back because that's probably one of the most iconic examples of a life history strategy. I like to think of a life history strategy as basically uh, the life cycle of an organism. It's a pattern of survival and reproduction that is shaped by evolution. A frog goes through many stages in its life. An embryo, a tadpole, a tadpole with legs, you know, a, tail, a frog with a tail, and then a full-size frog. And throughout each stage of its life, it's going to have slightly different behaviors that are going to impact um, its survival and its reproduction. Um, and these life history strategies we've actually talked about already. We talked about foraging life history strategies when we talked about generalist versus specialist species. How do organisms get their food? Uh, that's part of their life history strategy. Now I want to shift that focus onto not how they get their food, but how they get their mates. How do they reproduce? Uh, so we're going to talk about reproductive life history strategies. And uh, these are can be put into one of two camps. R selected species versus K selected species. And let's break each one of those down now. Um, uh, actually, before we do that, I want to talk briefly about how life history strategies can influence the changes in a population. For example, uh, a life history strategy might change the age at which an organism first reproduces. 
If, you, if an organism reproduces at a young age, it can have more babies throughout its life. But if it doesn't reproduce until it's older, it's going to have fewer babies throughout its life. Life history strategies might change the number of offspring that an individual has, which is obviously going to change the population. It also might change the amount of parental care required for each offspring. Humans give a lot of parental care to their babies. Cats, not as much. And lastly, uh, how much energy does it cost to reproduce? Uh, does it require a lot of energy to birth a baby? Or is it something that uh, you can do you know, every few months? So let's, let's dig into this. First, we'll talk about our selected species. These are what I like to call weedy species. Uh, they tend to reproduce when they're very young in age, uh, and they produce a lot of offspring, and each one of those offsprings has pretty low survival rates. Examples include things like weeds, mice, oh, whoops, uh, fish, bacteria. They produce a lot of eggs, a lot of offspring, a lot of seeds, etc., um, but not all of them are going to survive. So these species, as a general rule, are putting their energy into reproducing, not into surviving. As a result, most of these species tend to not live very long, uh, and they only tend to reproduce about once per life. This is a life history strategy we refer to as semoparity. Um, someone or an organism that reproduces once per lifetime is semoparous. Um, salmon do that. Uh, these R selected species tend to be opportunists because they, li they live fast, they die young, they take advantage of what they can get. Uh, and oftentimes that makes them pioneer species after primary or, or at the start of primary succession. Um, and because there's, uh, uh, they're opportunists and they, they take what they can get, there's not a lot of competition because the only other species around them are species just like them, the same species oftentimes, so there's low competition. Additionally, <coughs> excuse me. Additionally, they tend to have smaller bodies, smaller physical forms. They tend to have lower parental care. All of these organisms pictured here, once they are birthed, they don't really get care from their parents. Uh, and they tend to grow exponentially, meaning they grow faster with each subsequent time period. On the flip side of that is a case-selected species. Now, if you want to know what a case-selected species is, basically think about all these things I talked about and just talk about the complete opposite of them. So a case-selected species is uh, actually going to produce much, much later in life. Uh, and as a result, it's going to have fewer offspring, but more of those offspring are going to survive. Great example are humans. Humans can't start reproducing until we're age 15, technically, uh, but most of us culturally don't start reproducing until we're in our 20s or our 30s. That's much, much later in life compared to a mouse, which might reproduce within a year of its birth. Uh, additionally, or as a result, I should say, um, K-selected species to put, tend to put their energy into long-term survival. Uh, they have longer lifespans, and oftentimes they reproduce multiple times within a lifetime. This is the opposite of semoparous. This is a term we refer to as iteroparous. Humans, whales, elephants can have multiple babies throughout their life. These K-selected species tend to thrive in stable environments, uh, but these areas tend to have higher competition, so they're often uniquely adapted to their environments. They tend to be larger in size, and they tend to have high parental care. And lastly, their populations tend to grow at a logistic, in a, the shape of a logistic curve. <clears throat> Here's the difference between an exponential and a logistic curve. An exponential growth occurs, <clears throat> excuse me, exponentially. Uh, with each passing time period, more and more grow. Uh, X squared is the most famous and uh, obvious example of an exponential growth, whereas logistic growth starts exponentially and then it starts to slow down as limiting factors take into place. So whereas uh, our selected species can grow kind of <clears throat> indefinitely, case selected species not so much. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> oh my. Something I want you to keep in mind. <clears throat> oh goodness. <clears throat> Well, that, that's inconvenient. <clears throat> anyway, please disregard the cough behind the curtain. Uh, anyway, I want you to also keep in mind, uh, whether we're looking at K or R selected species, uh, reproductive life history strategies, whether you're K or whether you're R, can change not only over the individual's lifetime, but over many generations. A great example of that is looking at the total fertility rate of humans. Total fertility rate is the average number of babies per woman. So in 1980, you can see most women, on average, had about 1.7 babies, right? This is an average. That's why it's a decimal. I know that sounds weird. But you can see over time that this number fluctuates a lot. Whoops. Uh, it fluctuates a lot from jumping up to uh, almost 2.1, going back down again, jumping up, 
again and then decreasing again. So the amount of, uh, amount of offspring that an individual produces is going to change over time uh, in humans based on social and cultural values, but also uh, in all populations based on evolutionary pressures, uh, limiting factors like food, water, space, competition, etc. Another example of total fertility rate, uh, you can look the darker the country, the higher the total fertility rate, uh, but these, this map is not static. Although it shows a, a five-year average, if you look at this map from 100 years ago, all of these countries would be darker on average. All of the women in these countries would be having more babies on average. Uh, and, but this rate changes over time. The life history strategies change with time. Okay, uh, I want to put you uh, with a little bit of a brain teaser. We've, we've talked a little bit about what invasive species are and what they do, very briefly. But now I want you to think about, based on what you know about invasive species, what reproductive strategy do you think they have? Think about the term invasive, and think about what makes an invasive species invasive. So are they R-selected, or are they K-selected? Hopefully you picked R-selected, which is the correct choice. They tend to reproduce early and often. They tend to live fast, die young. They can uh, immigrate to an area, colonize that space very quickly. An example uh, is kudzu in uh, North America is a vine that can just absolutely overwhelm a habitat because it has no competitors, no natural predators, no diseases, and it can capitalize on a variety of different food sources. Uh, invasives, as a general rule, tend to be R-selected and they tend to be great competitors. They're good at colonizing new habitats, they can outcompete native species, they have no natural predators, and they can reproduce a lot faster than uh, K-selected species like an elephant, for example. Uh, whoops, 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 whoops. Um, as a result, these K-selected species tend to be more vulnerable to invasive species such as the zebra mussel or uh, kudzu here. Uh, lionfish is another example as well as um, uh, Ooh, I want to say, I'm blanking, I think it's Burmese python in the Everglades. A lot of people got them as pets, and then they didn't want them, and they let them go, and now they've uh, taken over the Everglades in Florida. Okay, uh, when we think about survivorship uh, and life history strategies, why not throw it on a graph? And the best way to do that is with something called a survivorship curve. And a survivorship curve, there are, there are three main types pictured here. They are going to show us the relative survival rates of a cohort in a population from their birth to the maximum average age of that population. And if you don't know what a cohort is, a cohort is basically a group of individuals of the same age. So the 11th graders are a cohort. The 12th graders are a slightly older cohort. Uh, most famous cohorts in our society are generations, Gen Z, Millennials, Gen X, etc. Um, those are all examples of cohorts. And if we look at these survivorship curves, what we'll see as we look at these cohorts, if we look at a, what is called a type 1 curve, uh, we see an interesting pattern. On the x-axis, we've got the age in relative units. I like to think about it as a percentage, whereas when you get to 100%, you've reached the sort of maximum age that you could get to as a species. 0% is you're just born. 50% is you're halfway through your life. And on the y-axis, we've got the number of survivors, organisms, individuals that have survived, and it's a logarithmic scale. So we go from 0 to 1, 1 to 10, 10 to 100, it's increasing by a power of 10. So it's a, a pretty steep drop, so to speak. And if we look at a type 1 curve, and the example they give are humans in red here, uh, on average, what we see is that throughout the first maybe 50 to 75 percent of a human's lifespan, survivorship is very high. Most babies live. Most toddlers live. Most teenagers live. Most young adults and uh, middle-aged adults live, right? There's not a lot, because of the high parental care that we get, uh, there's not a lot of causes for um, babies to be dying. Um, but once we hit an older age, maybe 65 and up, we start to see a severe drop-off in mortality. And that might seem intuitive to you. But let's compare that to a type 3 curve, something like an oak tree where there are a lot of individuals that start, let's say, a thousand, but very quickly we see a very, very, very rapid die-off. Maybe within the first 10 to 15 percent of the individual's uh, lifespan, we tend to see almost all of the individuals die off, right? Um, very few individuals are making it through that uh, very um, older age group, that fully grown tree. Uh, an, acorn, uh, an oak tree will produce thousands of acorns. Not all of them are going to grow into trees. In fact, Maybe none of them will. Maybe one of them will. 
right? And in between, we see this weird sort of hybrid mix of a type 2 survivorship curve, where at any stage in the organism's life, whether they're young, middle-aged, or older, they have an equal chance of dying, more or less. Uh, uh, examples include birds, reptiles, but even things like dogs. So what I want you to do now is think about R versus K selected and think about type 1 versus type 3 survivorship curves. Uh, and which is type 1 survivorship curve more of an R or more of a K? And is type 3 survivorship more of an R or more of a K? Okay, hopefully you got it. So uh, type 1 tends to be a K-selected species. They have high parental care. They produce fewer offspring, but we have high survivorship until very late in life. Um, Whereas with our selected species, we produce a lot of offspring, very low competition, uh, uh, but very few of those offspring tend to survive into later on in life. And uh, much like anything in environmental science, we're putting man-made artificial categorizations onto natural phenomena, so they're going to be middle ground between type 1 and type 3, and that's the type 2. Uh, not every species is going to fit on one of these lines, but type 2 is kind of an in-between. A good example I like to give are dogs. Dogs don't have a thousand babies, uh, but they don't have one baby. They have six to ten, somewhere in the middle ground. And sometimes a puppy dies, sometimes a dog dies mid-age, and uh, sometimes a dog dies later age. Although I would say, uh, now thinking about it with human care, um, dogs tend to have sort of high parental care, so maybe they're somewhere between a type 1 and type 2. You could say like, I don't know, type 1 and a half or something like that. Uh, but on average, right, um, organisms like birds, uh, reptiles, and even dogs and cats tend to have... Uh, um, equal chance of dying at any age range. So that's survivorship curves. What I'd like you to do now, um, here are the same survivorship curves just shown in two different ways. I'd like you to look at the rate of maturity, uh, or I'd like you to compare uh, curve one and curve three, and look at the rate of maturity. How quickly do they mature? How many offspring do they have? What is the survival rate like early on in their life? What is the survival rate like later on in their life, and how much parental care does each one receive. Okay, hopefully you've been able to break down uh, each curve a little bit and compare and contrast 1 and 3, compare and contra contrast uh, R and K, uh, but I, all, I want you to zoom in on K for a little bit because that's our survivorship curve as humans, and I want you to think about human survivorship. Over the past 200 years, do you think human survivorship has changed at all? If so, how do you think it's changed? Has it gotten better, gotten worse? And most importantly, why? If human survivorship has changed, why might that be? Take that, uh, keep it in the back of your mind for next class. If you've got any questions, let me know, and I will see you next time.